Good morning, church family. What a joy it is for me to introduce our guest preacher this morning. He's really not a guest. Dr. Ralph Carter served as the pastor of Brushy Creek Baptist Church for over 25 years, retiring in 2017. We are so excited to have he and his wife, Regina, back joining us this morning as he fills in to preach for me while I'm on vacation. Dr. Carter and his wife are members here, and they serve our church faithfully, as well as he serves in other capacities around the state, supply preaching and doing interims, helping churches along the way. It is such a joy to pastor a church that has been so healthy for so long that the previous pastor is part of our DNA. What a blessing of God for us here at Brushy Creek. I know you'll be blessed by Dr. Carter. I know you'll be blessed by the preaching of the Word. So I encourage you now, open your Bibles, turn on your devices, and hear what God has to say. He did that because he knew I'd mess up that thing about devices if I asked you to do that. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to Mark chapter 10, and we're going to look at verses 17 through 22 in just a moment. I want to preach on grace that's free but never cheap, and I want to state the point of the message from the very beginning. I know we preachers kind of do the opposite of that. We wait to the end and say, now here's the whole point of this thing, but I'm going to tell you in the beginning what the point is because... I don't want you to miss it for a second. I believe the attitude of a person who comes to Christ is of utmost importance. I think that when a person comes to Christ, there has to be a spirit within that person that just so wants the gospel that uh, he would do anything, she would do anything in the world to receive it. I don't think anyone ever comes to Christ with a nonchalant attitude. I don't think anybody ever comes to Christ being coaxed. I don't think it's something that's done reluctantly. I don't think you ever do it with one foot in and one foot out and saying, you know, okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And I'm fearful because of that, because of the fact that you're either all in or you're not. For at least 80 years and maybe longer, many of us in the church and chiefly conservative evangelical preachers like myself and many, many others, we have had a tendency to cheapen the gospel. We've tried to wholesale it. We have devalued the teaching of the gospel because we so want to see people come into the church and be baptized that we've often put more emphasis on the baptism than on their conversion experience and a life being changed for Christ. One theologian, in fact the theologian that influenced my thinking more than any other when I was a young pastor, a man who was martyred by Hitler in World War II, he was one of the greatest theologians in the world at that time. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer and they're going to put on the screen the statement he made about cheap grace and I'd like to read that for you this morning if I may. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. You hear that? Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. Now be real careful on these next few statements because he's not talking about what it costs Jesus. That's how we think. And he's talking about what it costs believers. It is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. Now look up right at me for just a moment. He's not talking about the life of Jesus. He's talking about the life of the believer. He says it's costly because it cost a man his life and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life he can ever have. So this morning I'm going to be talking about the attitude that a person has to have in order to come to Christ. We're going to look at two passages one of those is a historical passage, but that I mean it really actually took place. Jesus is going to convey it to us in about five verses, Mark 10 through 17 through 22. And then we're going to look at a second 
single verse passage that's a parable Jesus made up on the fly. It's not a true story. It's something Jesus told in order to illustrate a very true spiritual principle. So let's begin by looking at Mark chapter 17, or Mark chapter 10 rather, verse 17. I preached this passage over the 25 years two or three times, but this is an altogether different message. We're going to look at it in a different light. But look with me to verse 17, if if we may. As he, speaking of Jesus, was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus and his disciples are going somewhere, and out of the blue, this young man comes up unannounced. If you look at the title heading over the passage, you'll probably find in your Bible something about the rich young ruler. This passage doesn't tell us he was young. It doesn't tell us he was a ruler. But the synoptic gospels fill in those details, and thereby everyone calls him the rich young ruler. And he comes running up to Jesus. Now, Jesus had a lot of folks come up to him, and they asked him for all kinds of things. Could you come and heal my daughter? Would you heal me? Would you restore my sight? Would you heal my withered hand? He was constantly having folk come up to him, and sometimes they would beg. But this is the only place I can remember in the New Testament where anyone ever comes up to him and falls on their face before him and begs him to give them spiritual advice. Can you tell me how can I receive eternal life? And that's pretty telling. It tells me, one, that he wants eternal life. It tells me, two, he knows he now doesn't have it. It tells me, three, he believes Jesus knows the answer to the question. He wouldn't come running up to Jesus. He wouldn't humble himself by kneeling and looking up and asking this question unless in his mind and heart he thought, this guy has the answer. So you got to wonder, who does he think Jesus is anyway, right? I mean, is Jesus someone real special? Well, obviously he thinks that, or why come to Jesus? And tell me, how do I get this eternal life? So you're going to see in just a moment, he's a moral man. But as moral as he is, he knows there's something lacking in his life. And can I tell you something? Every person in this room, if you'll be honest about it, has had at least one occasion, many of us, many occasions, where we have come to a moment of awakening in our life where we look at ourselves and we know this, I don't measure up. I'm not saying you're a bad person, that you break all the laws of the Scripture. But you know this, if you're honest with yourself, you've come to a place where you said to yourself, you know what, I just don't measure up. I don't seem to be able to do this God thing. I mean, I know He expects me to live a certain way, and I want to try to live that way, and I've held the Scripture up as my standard, and that's how I'm going to live, but it just doesn't happen. We disappoint ourselves, and we come to a place where we recognize there's got to be more than what I'm doing. There's got to be more to it than I have been able to accomplish in this point in time, and I'm lacking something and I'm wanting in my life. Well, look at Jesus' response, because it's, it's pretty staggering. In verse 18, the Scripture says, Why do you call me good, Jesus asked him. Now, just stop right there for a second and look up this way. If you had been writing this story and you had never read it before, obviously 99.9% of you have read this story, you know what's coming. But if you had never read this story, you would never, there's not a soul in the building, not a soul on the planet, in my estimation, who would have ever said what Jesus said. Do you know when I pastored here and since I left here and before I came here, Almost every day of my life, I have prayed, Lord, lead someone to me today that I can share the gospel with. If there's somebody out there who wants to know how to be saved, would you just lead them to me? Would you just have them come in my pathway? When I pastored here, I would oftentimes, the first thing in the morning, over in my office across the way, I would look out on the highway and I'd think about people passing up and down that busy street and I would say, God, if there's somebody out there today who needs Christ, would you just lead them to see our sign, our buildings, just stop and come in and say, would you tell me how to be saved? Now, obviously, that didn't happen a whole lot. 
But it has on rare occasion happened where someone would come up to me for whatever reason. They'd say, could you tell me about Christ? Boy, can I tell you about Christ. I'd love to do that. And you prayed those kind of prayers, right? Lord, lead that person who's hungry and ready and willing to come to me and I'll tell them about Jesus. So what do you do? When somebody asks you that question, you don't run them around trying to get them lost. They already know they're lost. You move straight to salvation, right? Let me tell you about Jesus because Jesus is the answer. What you need to do is repent of your sin and give your heart and life to Christ. And you need to trust him and die to your sins and and follow the Lord Jesus. And let's pray and ask God to forgive you. And you're off and running, right? In the evangelical world, he's just lobbed Jesus a softball. And what you're expecting is Jesus just to knock it clear out of the park, right? But you know what Jesus says? Why are you calling me good? I mean, who would say that? You've changed lanes. This guy's wanting to know, how can I have eternal life? And you're taking exception to the fact that he calls you good. What's wrong with, hey, I'm kind of pleased if somebody says, hey, you're a good guy. You're a good teacher. Well, that's okay by me. You know, I don't get that very often. So if you tell me, good, okay, I'm going with that. Now, let's talk about Jesus. But Jesus says, why do you call me good? Jesus wanted to know, who do you think I am? And why do you call me good? And it's not what you might think. It's not that he believes Jesus is God because that's what Jesus goes on to say. Jesus goes on to say, quoting what now we know is Romans 3.10, there is none good but one, and that is God. So are you saying I'm God? He knows this young man doesn't think of him as God, but you know what he thinks? The young man thinks of himself as good as well. He's saying you're good kind of like I'm good. You're a good teacher. I'm a good man. Good teacher. I know you're somebody special. I've watched you live. I've listened to you preach. I've seen the miracles you do. You're not run of the mill. You're good. But he also thinks of himself as good too. And you're going to see that clearly in just a minute. Can I break the news to you if you haven't already discovered this? That's how you think of yourself too. You think of yourself as pretty good. We all do. Now, occasionally we'll run somebody who just hates themselves and they're down about everything, but most of us, we kind of think we're special, don't we? In fact, I hate to break the news to you, you think you're better than you really are. Isn't that right? That's yes and no and don't know, right? You, th- you think you're better than you are. We all kind of think that. We forget those bad things we've done and remember all the good things we've ever accomplished in our life. And this man was no exception. Jesus knew that. That's why I think poses this question, why do you call me good? And then he says, there's none good but one, and that is God. And then look at the next verse. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Jesus takes him straight to the commandments in Exodus 20. But watch this, there are ten of them. He omits the first four and looks to the last six. Theologians call that the commandments that are on the horizontal plane and not the vertical plane. The vertical plane being our relationship with God. And he deals strictly with those commandments that have to do with our relationship with man. You know why I think he does that? I don't know. Jesus doesn't tell us. But I'm going to speculate at this point. I think Jesus omits the ones about his relationship with God because that's subjective. I know lots of people. In fact, I've talked to hundreds of people through the years who thought they were in right relationship with God, but they weren't in right relationship with God. It's an assumption a lot of people make. I've heard talk show hosts. I've heard Oprah Winfrey when she was on. She used to talk all the time about being right with God. And about this spiritual, but it was never based on scriptures, based on what she felt. So Jesus doesn't even go to talking about how are you with God. He does that which is pretty objective, and that is how are you getting along with man? Because you see, we can't deceive ourselves about that. 
If I'm having trouble with mom and dad, if I'm having trouble with my neighbors, if I'm having trouble with people at work, if I'm not thinking pure thoughts, man, I can pretty much know that. So Jesus says, okay, those commandments on the man-to-man plane, how are you doing with those? And listen to what he says. Pretty staggering, really. He says, teacher, I have kept all these from my youth. Now, he's either an outright liar or he's telling the truth or he thinks he's telling the truth. And I'm going to tell you, there's nothing to indicate he's an outright liar. He's not trying to snow Jesus. He knows Jesus is too sharp for that, whoever he is. He's not trying to be an outright liar, but I'm going to tell you something. He's deceived himself, and that's something else that most all of us in this audience have done at one time or another. We see ourselves as being good, but we're not as good as we think we are. If somebody asks you, have you followed the Ten Commandments, you know what your response will be? Probably very much the same as this. I've tried to. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. They've been the standard, the goal by which we judged our character and our conduct. But at the end of the day, we know, well, I messed up here. Did I mess up everywhere? No. So we give ourselves brownie points for when we don't mess up. I treated so-and-so honest. I treated my mother good. I did this thing over here that was a good thing. So we look at ourselves, and as a whole, we respond, I've kept all these from my youth up. But in reality, there have been lots of places along the way where we fail to do what we should do. So notice what Jesus says. This is really important. Verse 21. Then looking at him, Jesus loved him. Now, I've got to stop and tell you this. There's some theologians out there, and I'm not trying to pick a fight with anybody out there. But there are theologians today who say, you know, Jesus didn't love everybody. God doesn't love everybody. He loves the elect. But I'm going to tell you, I just don't believe that. I believe in election, but I'm going to tell you something. I believe God loves every man, woman, and child. I believe the scripture teaches that every one Jesus would love to see come to know him as Savior and Lord. And so he loves this man. I know that about this man. Jesus loved him and he said, you lack one thing. Boy, he's all ears now. Can you see him perk up? Tell me what it is. This is what I've been waiting on. Go sell all you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. He wants to know, Jesus says. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. Can I tell you something? You're going to see in the next verse, it stunned this man who was asking the question. But can I tell you something else? It stunned the disciples too. They talk to Jesus later about it because they can't believe their ears. What are you saying to him? You're telling me he has to go sell everything? Suppose Jesus was on this stage this morning, and he looked out here in this congregation, and you asked the question, what must we do to be saved? And he looked at any one of you in this room, and he said to you, go sell everything you have. Give it all away. And come and take up the cross and follow me. My guess is you'd be stunned too. You'd be kind of taken back by that because we think of Jesus doing the giving, not us doing the giving, right? And Jesus says, give up everything and come and follow me. Now Jesus knows, and this is why he asked the man to do that. He knows what this man's God is. You know what his God is? You're going to be tempted to say his money, and it is in a manner of speaking. But I believe this, having dealt with a lot of rich people in my life, it's not the money so much as it is the security the money affords. You see, the money is his God in that he feels safe and secure so long as he's got his money. That's what he's depending on in getting him through life. It's not a stack of dollar bills. It's the security. I feel as long as I can insulate myself with money and have what I need, I can make it through life. And this life is all there really is from a human perspective oftentimes. And so 
That's what he's thinking. Jesus says, go sell everything and come and follow me. Now look at his response, verse 22. But he was stunned at this demand. I love that word because it paints a picture. And he went away grieving. He's not flipping about it because he had great possessions. Listen, if you get this picture in your mind, you got the wrong image, that Jesus says, give everything away. And he says, what? You're out of your mind. No way I'm doing it. You're a nutcase. And turns and walks away mad. Not the picture. He still wants what Jesus can offer. He wants to be a follower of Jesus. He wants eternal life. He knows he doesn't have it. But he's so short-sighted, all he can see is right now in the fact that I'm secure in what I have. And this is what I want. And so, grievingly, sadly, he turns and he goes his way. Can I tell you something? All three synoptic writers give us this story, and not one of them ever comes back and says he returned and talked to Christ a second time. He got home and he had a change of mind and heart and he came back to Jesus and, and Jesus allowed him to be a disciple. If that had happened, I assure you, they'd have told us. But Jesus doesn't do that. And I want to tell you something else I see here that's always stood out to me. Jesus let him walk. I'll bet you anything there were some disciples there saying, uh, Jesus, he'd make a good disciple. I mean, he's holier and more righteous in many ways than some of us, and he's got money. But Jesus doesn't go after him. I've heard preachers say that Jesus really didn't want him to give up everything. It's not really essential that he give up everything. Jesus was testing him. That's ludicrous. And the way I know that is because Jesus doesn't say, hey, buddy, come back, I was just kidding you. Jesus doesn't say, hey, you know what? Now, I didn't really mean that literally. You don't have to really give it away. It's okay. You can keep it. You just have to be willing to give it away. He didn't say that. He's going to let him walk. He does let him walk. You say, well, what kind of attitude do you have to have to be saved? Well, I'm going to show you one more verse, and I'm going to bring it to a close. In Matthew 13, 44, Jesus tells a one-verse parable. And I don't want you to turn there and look to it. I want you to watch the screen because they're going to put this verse word for word on the screen. You'll see every word. But I just want to break it down for you a phrase at a time. You ready? So let's look at this last verse. The kingdom of heaven. When you read the phrase the kingdom of heaven in the gospel of Matthew, he's writing to a Jewish audience. He's not talking about a physical kingdom with boundaries. He's talking about the way God rules. In fact, every one of you, whenever you come to that phrase in the gospel of Matthew, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, you can just immediately think, here's how God rules. Here's how God reigns. Here's how God does things. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure. Like treasure. You ever think about how God reigns? It's like treasure. It's like treasure. How many of you like treasure? Everybody does. Jesus says, wherever a man's treasure is, there is his heart also. Everybody likes treasure. Now, we all treasure different things, right? Some folk like this man treasure money. This man we just looked at. Some of us don't really care a whole lot about money. Can I tell you something? God has blessed me. You blessed me while I was your pastor here. We have a nice home, and we're living comfortably. But God, I just tell you, when I surrendered ministry, I never had one single thought about money. The reason is because I didn't grow up with money. My dad was the first sergeant in the army. We never had money. I never aspired to have money. I, just, I didn't think about it. When I went to seminary, I never thought, boy, this is going to lead to me being rich one day. <laughs> I just never thought about it. I never gave a nickel about money. But one man's treasure is another man's trash. There were things I did care about. I'll tell you about that toward the end of the sermon. There were some things I really cared about a lot. Some goals, some ambitions I had in life. Money wasn't among them. Some of you, like in the first service, they love antiques. You hate them, right? You don't know trashy antique. 
you know, flowery pattern couch or anything like that. Wood carvings, right? Don't you love this wood bedroom suit? No, you want metal. You want something that looks industrial, right? Your parents come to your house and think, poor kids. <laughs> hmm. You say, I made this. They go, I know. <laughs> right? So he says, the kingdom of heaven, the way God rules is like treasure buried in a field. Now we're getting somewhere. You know this treasure is valuable because somebody has gone and buried it in a field. How many of you like finding treasures? Everybody, right? My nephew, David Crowther, my sister's boy, both of her boys are preachers, one in Texas, one is in Wichita, Kansas, good little preacher. He's the carbon copy of my dad physically, how he thinks, everything about him, right? My sister lived across the street from my dad, and so those boys grew up across the street from my dad, and my dad just idolizes this little boy. He's not a little boy now, but when he was a little boy. From the time he was five to the time he was seven, he was the cutest kid on the face of the planet. He just had such unusual ways about it. He was so focused. I've never seen a little kid as focused as David was. He would be like an actor in a play where he would get in character, and when he got in character, he couldn't come out. It's not like he was that for an hour or two hours or three hours. He was that all day long. And the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. Three and four months he would stay in character. Every morning of his life, for a while, he dressed like Clint Eastwood. He developed the swagger. He would say Clint Eastwood kind of things. One day, he popped out a word of profanity with his mother on the way to school, because Clint Eastwood did. She whipped his little fanny. <laughs> One time, he's a soldier. He dresses up in armor regalia, or in army regalia, and, and struts his stuff, and he's a soldier, about four months. One time, he's a farmer. He wears overalls, bib overalls, got the plaid shirt, Straw in his mouth, talks real country like, you know. He's a farmer. He does that three or four months. One time, though, he dresses up as a pirate. He's got the little patch over his eye, the hat, everything, arg. He goes to my daddy's house dressed that way. He goes to the neighbor's house dressed that way. He's just a pirate. My dad, who loves this boy, like I said, with all his heart, he loved that face where he's a pirate. So my dad would get out at night and take a shoebox and take some of my mama's costume jewelry and put it in that shoebox and go out in his yard or his son, grandson's yard and dig a hole and put that shoebox down on the ground and cover it over. And then get a sheet of paper and record how many steps it was from that shoebox to this place in the yard. And then you'd turn right and go that many, shoe pla- that many steps in the yard. Then you go to the doghouse or you go around the basketball go and... And then he'd take that little sheet of paper and roll it up like a pirate's mat, put a ribbon around it, and stick it on his front door so that next morning when David got up, he'd find that sheet of paper. Well, he would spend hours out in the yard. His feet weren't as big as my dad's, and so his steps would be different. But he was going to dig holes wherever he had to <laughs> till he found that treasure, right? And when he found it, man, that was a cool day. So Jesus says the kingdom of heaven, the way God rules, is like treasure Buried in a field that a man found. Boy, David loved finding that treasure. We all love finding treasure. I walk 10,000 steps a day. When you walk and you're my age, you better keep your eyes on the ground instead of out here. And so I find money from time to time. I found a $20 bill one time. I found $4 of change. A little kid's walking along. He apparently had a hole in his pocket. Dropped about three quarters on the ground. I picked him up and said, Finders keepers, loser sweepers. <laughs> and then the story says that a man found and reburied. What? Now, who finds something and then reburies it? 
Who does that? The story gets a little wacky here, if you're reading it slowly the way I am. He finds the treasure, and then he says, oh, here's a bright idea. Let's bury it again. So he digs the hole back, and he puts the money in it, and he covers it over the treasure, whatever it was. And then we read the next part. And then in his joy, he's elated about finding this, in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has. Wow, now that's really weird. He finds this treasure. Instead of keeping it, he reburies it. He goes away in great joy and joyfully, not begrudgingly, joyfully, he sells everything he has. If you take Jesus literally, it means he sells his house. He didn't have cars then, but if he had one, he sold his car. He cashes in and liquidates his 401k. He takes his savings out of the bank, takes his checking money, puts it all together. Got a few clothes. I sell these clothes. Got a bass boat, sells his bass boat. He sells everything he's got. That's the picture Jesus gives us. In his joy, he does that. He goes and sells everything he has. Are you as confused as I am at this point? What is he doing? And then buys that field. Boy, now I get it. Whatever it is he's found buried in that guy's field that he knows is not his and he's afraid to take away from that spot because he knows as sure as he does, somebody's going to come and say, where'd you find that? found it on such and such piece of property, then it's his. It's not yours. So you know what he does? He puts it back in the ground, and he so wants this. He's got all these things he has amassed throughout his lifetime. But he so wants this, he'll give all that for what's here. And in his joy, he goes, and he sells it all. And he buys that piece of land so he can have what's buried in the ground. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. That's the attitude of a person who comes to Jesus. They don't come screaming and kicking and begrudgingly and tricked into it or coaxed into it. Would you pray this prayer? Well, okay. No, with great joy, they say, I got to have that. There's nothing. That's what I want. And once they've experienced, I'd give anything to have that. Nothing means more than that. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Philippians 3.8. He knows what I'm talking about. More than that, I also consider everything to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth or garbage or rubbish so that I may gain Christ. It's how it was for the man in the field who discovered that hidden treasure. It's how it was for the Apostle Paul. And I close by telling you this. It's how it was in my life the day I came to know Christ. I had dreams not of making money, but I'll tell you what I had dreamt since I was a little bitty boy, about eight years old, nine years old. I remember watching my first Army-Navy football game with my dad. And dad had always told me about West Point. And when I heard about West Point and watched those cadets, that Army-Navy game, I thought to myself, that's what I want to do. It wasn't like a kid who says, you know, when they're five, I want to be a garbage truck man because I, I've watched those guys come through the neighborhood. It was something that I really and truly in my heart wanted to do as a young boy, even at eight, seven and eight years old. I want to go to West Point. When my grades would dip, my dad would say, you better get your grades up because they will take you at West Point if you don't have good grades. I mean, it'd scare me and I'd, I'd work harder. So when I was nine, a preacher came to my house Sunday school teacher had put him on me. She said, he's the only boy in my class that had been saved. And he told me about Jesus, and I already knew everything he told me about Jesus. I didn't understand it, didn't register with me, didn't click. I'd never seen what was in that buried treasure. 
But I went along with him and I prayed a prayer and I was baptized. But I was just as lost as I ever was. And then when I was 14, my dream had never changed. And at 14, I'm sitting in the next last row of Williams Heights Baptist Church in Anderson, South Carolina. And I hear a gospel message and my sin became so overwhelming. The picture of it was so overwhelming. I knew if I died that day, I would die away from God. And I wanted God, but I just didn't know how to get him into my life. I wanted to live eternally, but I didn't know how to get him into my life. And I went forward on an invitation and ended up kneeling by myself with no one else and just praying and telling Jesus, Jesus, I believe you died for me and I believe you will forgive my sins. And I want that. I want to have a relationship with you. I want the peace and joy that comes by knowing I am right with you. And I want that more than anything else because you see, sitting back there on that next last row, the struggle for me was this. If you walk down this aisle and you give your heart and life to Christ, you're going to have to die to everything that's important to you. All your dreams, all your ambitions, all that's ever meant anything to you is to go to West Point. Now, can guys go to West Point and be Christian? Of course they can. But you see... As a young boy, I was convinced of this, and I believe this to this day. I knew, I knew if I ever gave my heart and life to Christ that God had a purpose in my life and that he was going to call me to preach. And it's the last thing on this earth that I wanted to do. I didn't particularly even like preachers. I thought, to be honest, a lot of my men were kind of sissy. And it was the last thing I ever wanted to do was to be a sissy. And that day, I wanted that buried treasure so badly. And I said, God, whatever you want, that's what I want. And I surrendered all my ambitions to give my heart and life to Christ. And I've never been disappointed. It was worth the trade. But I'm going to tell you something. You will never come to Jesus by holding on to all this that you presently consider dear and saying, okay, I'll take you as an addendum to my life. Come and you can be a part of this. It's never that way. Just not. You either surrender all or you keep what's yours and lose what's his. Jesus said the only way a man ever finds his life is to lose his life, and he meant that. We can't water that down. We can't make it convenient and easy for you where it's, oh, it's not tough. Yeah, it is tough. You're going to give up this life to come to Christ or you either won't come and he won't run after you say, okay, I'm going to cut you a deal. It's either him or it's nothing. But if you take him, it's everything. 